All right, folks, we're in the book Salvation and Godly Rule, and chapter 4, let's go. 4. Salvation and Sovereignty The biblical doctrine of God is that he is eternal. Psalm 92, 1 Timothy 1.17 Immutable, James 1.17, Malachi 3.6 Incomprehensible, Psalm 145.3 Almighty, Genesis 17.1 Free, Psalm 115.3 And, among other things, Absolute, Exodus 3.14 God also from all eternity decreed all things that come to pass Isaiah 45, 6 and 7, Ephesians 1, 5 and 6, 11, John 19, 11, Acts 2, 23, 4, 27 to 28, 15, 18, Proverbs 16, 33, Romans 9, 11, 13, 15 and 16, 18, 22 and 23, Proverbs 16, 4, etc. By his own sovereign will and for his own purpose. The Greek concept that some idea or universal is above God or governs God is alien to the Bible. The idea that the good, the true and the beautiful have an ultimacy governing God is impossible for Scripture because the reverse is true. I'm just going to stop it there because my microphone is pointing at my left shoulder. That's not good. Well... I'm exaggerating, slightly off center. Hello, this is Nathan. Thanks for joining me in the booth. I really hope you're enjoying the live streams and videos. To find out more about this narration project, or to make a donation, go to nathanteacher.com Thanks. The good is what God decrees and does. The idea of the good does not govern God but is instead governed by God and his being? In brief, God is sovereign. There is nothing by which he can be judged, because he is the principle of all judgment. Nothing governs or determines God except himself, because God is absolutely free, self-existing and self-determinative. When asked by Moses to name or define himself, God refused to do so, saying, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Exodus 3.14 God cannot be truly defined, because he is himself the principle of all definition. All things are truly known only in terms of him and his sovereign purpose and decree. All the ostensible definitions of God are simply partial catalogues of his attributes. No definition can circumscribe God. In a sense, we can say that God is the only true existentialist, in that he is self-existent and he is to be understood only in terms of himself and without reference to anything outside of himself. He alone has aseity or self-existence. Neither his essence nor his existence are derivative And whereas existentialism refuses to believe in any system or purpose in the universe because it is as yet external to man, for God there can be no other system or purpose dominating or controlling the universe because there is nothing external to his decree, counsel and government. He alone is Lord and Sovereign. Because God alone is Sovereign Lord, God alone can truly save man because God alone decrees ordains and governs all things absolutely. In Isaiah 45, God declares, Tell ye and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together, who hath declared this. Good, I wanted to bring this down. Just going to go into the kneeling position in my ergonomic kneeling chair. 
going for the action. Pow, pow. Who else, who else declared it? Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me. And just God and a Saviour, there is none beside me. Look unto me, and be you saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, Every tongue shall swear. In verses 14 to 25, the nations are told that, quote, They must be subdued, but only in order to be blessed and saved, which is declared to have been the divine purpose, and revealed as such from the beginning. End quote. In these three verses, 21 to 23, the nations reminded... The nations are reminded. It's the passive voice. The nations are reminded that only God is the ultimate and sovereign, and there is none else who is absolute Lord save God, and none able to save but God himself. Moreover, God declares himself, quote, a just God and a saviour, end quote. As Plumtree noted, quote, stress is laid on the union of the two attributes, which in human actions are often thought incompatible, end quote. God asserts the ultimacy in himself of all things, here specifically of both justice or judgment and salvation. The absolute judge is also the only saviour, and the nations cannot sue for either at any other court or agency. All things have their origin in him. Quote, The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Proverbs 16.4 Quote Out of him came forth the corner Out of him the nail Out of him the battle bow Out of him every oppressor together Zechariah 10.4 Thus nothing can be truly understood unless we begin with the fact of God's sovereignty as revealed in his infallible word Where men take as their starting point some aspect of creation they quickly drift into heresies One Reformed pastor declared that his starting point was the total depravity of man, and hence the need of a saviour. The defects of this position are readily apparent. Man was not always fallen. He was once in a state of innocence. Many men are now in a state of grace, and far more in a state of glory. Even more, by beginning with the condition of man, his position has increasingly become Arminian in practice, man-centred and concerned with man's needs rather than God's glory. Moreover, to begin with any aspect of creation is quickly to face impossible antimonies and contradictions, tensions which offer no hope of resolution. Thus, many scientists, by their analysis of the behaviour of the physical universe or of the nature of energy, and in a strict end end in a strict and naturalistic determinism. They not only can make no place for freedom, but also they find themselves sometimes unwilling to speak of man's mind and consciousness. Some call consciousness an epiphenomenon, others avoid the term consciousness altogether. Still others, insistent on affirming historic humanism, are staunch in affirming the freedom of man, and with existentialism, we have a radical assertion of this freedom. Sartre will not even accept the concept of an unconscious aspect of man, lest man's freedom be surrendered to the underworld of nature. Modern science and humanism, both born of an earlier humanism, are now in contradiction to one another, however much at one in their hostility to God. Both affirm a valid aspect of human experience, both the simple naive experience of man and the scientific analysis of creation point to an order and necessity which seems to indicate determinism. 
although some thinkers, because man's knowledge of the universe is not total, temper their description of that necessity by calling it a probability concept, they still operate in the laboratory and in life on... Uh, okay, I got it. I think I got it. They still operate in the laboratory and in life on the premise of a necessary and determined order. However, naive experience also confirms man's freedom. Man's decisions, moral and intellectual, are often reached after much uncertainty, indecision, inner agony and torment, as well as a major hesitancy that points to the reality of the free... Torment, as well as a major hesitancy that points to the reality of the free choice made. They indicate, moreover, the frequent burden man feels as having... A bit. They indicate, moreover, the frequent burden man feels at having this freedom. Naive experience thus confirms both determinism and freedom. Similarly, scientific evidences are commonly cited to vindicate both determinism and indeterminism. On the human level, there is no reconciling these mutually exclusive facts. Very early, Greek philosophy faced the same contradiction. Heraclitus, circa 536 to 470 BC, saw the mutability of all things. Quote, it is not possible to step twice in the same river. It is impossible to touch the same mortal substance twice, but though the rapid, but through the rapidity. Okay, let's do that again. To touch the same mortal substance twice but through the rapidity of change they scatter and again combine, or rather, not even again or later, but the combination and separation are simultaneous and approach and separate, end quote. All things change and are changed, so that mutability is the basic fact about reality. In contrast, Parmenides of Alea, circa 475 BC, insisted on the one basic changing substance behind all changes, Heraclitus had seen the random change in character of reality. Quote, the Ferris universe is but a dust heap piled up at random. End quote. For Heraclitus, all things flow. Quote, Those who step into the same river have different waters flowing ever upon them. End quote. For Parmenides, there is one unchanging being which is also thought and is. For Parmenides, there is one unchanging being which is also thought and matter, and also matter. For Parmenides, there is one unchanging being which is also thought and also matter. Quote, for it is the same thing to think and to be, end quote. Again, quote, It is all the same thing to me from what point I begin, or I shall return again to this same point, end quote. Moreover, quote, Being has no coming into being and no destination, for it is whole of limb, without motion and without end. How could being perish? How could it come into being? End quote. In effect, there is no change. Heraclitus and Parmenides thus came to radically different conclusions by stressing varying aspects of experience. They amply demonstrated the inability of human experience and reason to comprehend the nature of reality or to reconcile its apparent paradoxes. The consequence of such an approach is a reduction of reality at the very least to only one aspect of its appearance and thus to render it an absurdity. Where we begin with the sovereign God and his infallible word, these problems disappear. 
just as the problem of the one and the many is reconciled in the equal ultimacy or particularity and plurality in the Trinity. Ah, that should have not good enough. Just as the problem of the one and the many is reconciled in the equal ultimacy of particularity and plurality in the Trinity, so the problem of absolute predestination and of freedom is reconciled in God. Predestination is not determinism, which permits no will nor is personal, but is personal, particular and universal, and also permits freedom. In God there is, quote, no variableness nor shadow of turning, James 1.17. God says, quote, I am the Lord, I change not, Malachi 3.6. The unvarying, immutable nature of God is clearly set forth in Scripture. However, God is not a prisoner of some outside law of his own nature. Ah, no, ah, no, I Skip forward about 500 pages. I am clicking, clicking, going back, and the clicking, making the clicking. Make the click, the click, the click. Okay, totally lost now. I'm going to have to pause. Here we go. The unvarying, immutable nature of God is clearly set forth in Scripture. However, God is not a prisoner of some outside law of, or, or, or of his nature. This is reality. However, God is not a prisoner of some outside law or of his nature. He is absolutely free. Quote, but our God is in the heavens, he hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Psalm one hundred and fifteen three. The immutability and freedom of God are absolute and primary. The predestination and freedom of man are secondary and are aspects of God's creation. The freedom of man is the freedom of a creature, not a freedom of God. It is very real as a secondary freedom and cannot be reduced to an illusion without at the same time making mind, will and consciousness in man illusions also. The counsel and determined purposes of man are no less real for being a secondary factor. This distinction is an important one and it clarifies the problem with respect to salvation. Because God, from all eternity, freely and unchangeably has ordained whatsoever comes to pass, for this very reason, man has a secondary and real part in his salvation. As the Westminster Confession stated it, quote, God, from all eternity, did, by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass, yet so as thereby... Yeah, Yet, so as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. End quote. The secondary freedom of man rests only in the absolute freedom of God. As Shaw noted, quote, It may be further observed that, although God has unchangeably ordained whatsoever comes to pass, yet this does not take away the contingency of second causes, either in themselves or as to us. Nothing can be more contingent than the decision of the lot. Quote, the lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. End quote. Proverbs 16.33 End quote. Existentialism, however, requires an absolute and primary freedom for man. To say this means that man claims to be his own God, a fact which Sartre affirms. Quote, the best way to conceive of the fundamental project of human reality is to say that man is a being whose project is to be God. God, 
value and supreme end of transcendence represents the permanent limit in terms of which man makes known to himself what he is. To be man means to reach towards being God, or, if you prefer, man fundamentally is the desire to be God. End quote. Because for Sartre there is no God, man, quote, is condemned to be free, end quote, that is, absolute freedom is his responsibility as the intelligent being in an absurd and irrational universe. Since there is for him no God and no absolute predestination, gonna take a break, gonna take a drink of water, 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 drink it, H2O, let's go, in the lubrication, in the nation, station, Self-flagellation. Okay, look. I'm lost. Okay, I'll find again. Hey, oh, let's go. An irrational universe. Since there is for him no God and no absolute predestinating and eternal counsel of God, man is free and must provide that counsel. Quote, in other words, there is no determinism. Man is free. Man is freedom. End quote. Dostoevsky said, quote, If God didn't exist, everything would be possible. End quote. That is the very starting point of existentialism. Indeed, everything is permissible if God does not exist, and as a result, man is forlorn, because neither within him nor without does he find anything to cling to. He can't start making excuses for himself. End quote. Man thus begins with his bare existence, without essence and without an eternal counsel and law of God. Quote, Man makes himself. He isn't ready made at the start. In choosing his ethics, he makes himself, and force of circumstances is such that he cannot abstain from choosing one. End quote. Sartre eliminates God as a predestinating power, but, quote, force of circumstances, end quote, a blind power now enters the picture to push man into making himself. For Sartre, this absolute freedom is, quote, the basis of all values, end quote. It is personal, individual, and anarchistic in that every man is his own God, but necessity and survival require this freedom to be social, to limit itself. Quote, and in wanting freedom, we discover that it depends entirely on the freedom of others and that the freedom of others depended. And that the freedom of others depends on ours. End quote. In Sartre's No Exit, Garcin declares, quote, Hell is other people. End quote. In a world of many gods, another claimant to be God must be a devil to the man who affirms himself as God. Lehan called attention to the contradiction in Sartre, who wants an antisocial and a social goal to mutually exclusive ends, although his philosophy is essentially antisocial. Quote, Existential choice and freedom are constructed along a social... Existential choice and freedom are constructed along asocial lines. Existential commitments, on the other hand, is a principle of social involvement. The hero is thus torn between the instinct to live outside society and the guilt which follows such a choice. These two positions are mutually exclusive, and yet to see them both in existential philosophy is only to place Sartre's no exit next to his What is Literature? End quote. Sartre is thus concerned about the social and personal salvation of men as he defines it, and yet logically only concerned with his own freedom. Since he has, quote, discarded God the Father, there...
discarded God the Father, there has to be someone to invent values, end quote. This means that because, quote, life has no meaning a priori, end quote, it is therefore, quote, up to you to give it a meaning, and value is nothing else but the meaning that you choose, end quote. Sartre wants an existential humanism, but not, quote, the self-enclosed humanism of Kant, and let it be said of fascism, end quote. Man must transcend himself, not in the sense that God is transcendent, quote, but in seeking outside of himself a goal which is just this liberation, just this particular fulfilment, end quote. Briefly, this means social involvement as man's salvation. He is free because there is no God, but he is liberated from this freedom by turning it into social involvement. It is thus a surrender of freedom to society rather than to God. More than that, it is a surrender of being. Quote, we can understand after these remarks that the abstract ontological quote, desire to be is unable to represent the fundamental human structure of the individual. It cannot be an obstacle to his freedom. Freedom, in fact, is strictly identified with nihilation. The only being which can be called free is the being which nihilates its being. Moreover, we know that nihilation is lack of being and cannot be otherwise. Freedom is precisely the being which makes itself a lack of being. End quote. As previously noted, André Malraux saw that the death of God involves the death of man. The death of God is the death of man, which also means the death of man's society. In a famous passage, Sartre's pessimism appears clearly. Quote, Every human reality is a passion in that it projects losing itself so as to found being and by the same stroke to constitute the... What the heck? This is what? I smell crisps. I smell cheese and onion crisps. What's wrong with me? What's wrong? Every human reality is a passion in that it projects losing itself so as to find being and by the same stroke to constitute the in in itself that this is what's throwing me the in itself this is philosophers what a bunch by the same stroke to constitute the in itself which escapes contingency by being its own foundation the ens causa sui which religions call god Thus, the passion of man is a reverse of that of Christ, for man loses himself as man in order that God may be born. But the idea of God is contradictory, and we lose ourselves in vain. Man is a useless passion. End quote. Thus, when man proclaims the death of God and man's freedom from God, the meaning of all things, including freedom and salvation, disappears, and man himself announces his own futility and death. Because the universe is one of absolute law and meaning, being the handiwork of the absolute predestinating God, man's life has meaning, but a derivative rather than self-creating meaning. Because God has absolute freedom, man, created in his image, has a secondary and creaturely freedom. In a world of pure chance and of no meaning, freedom has no meaning either. Freedom has no meaning either. For, for freedom, for, for freedom. Your chance, son. Freedom has no meaning either. The absolute freedom of God is the absolute self-determination of God. The relative and secondary freedom of man is also his contingent self-determination. Thus, from start to finish, the initiative and the determination of man... Thus, thus, from start to finish, the initiative and the determination in man's salvation is God's absolute and predestinating purpose. 
Romans 9 makes it clear that this sovereign decree precedes our existence and indeed all creation, Ephesians 1, 4, 9, 11. Moreover, as the Westminster Confession declares, quote, All those whom God hath predestined unto life and those only he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time effectually to call by his word and spirit out of that state of sin and death in which they are by nature to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ, enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God, taking away their heart of stone and giving unto them an heart of flesh, renewing their wills and by his almighty power determining them to that which is good and effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ, yet so as they come most freely, being made willing by his grace. End quote. Only because God is sovereign is man's life and salvation even possible. The Greco-Roman world in the days of the early church affirmed the absolute freedom of man from a divine predestination and also the ultimacy of chance. However, just as Sartre introduced, quote, the force of circumstances, end quote, so the thinkers of that day introduced and developed the force of circumstances of the stars, fate and other aspects of man's environment so that man's freedom was destroyed and man became the determined product of a meaningless environment and passive before the world, his maker. The Christians, on the other hand, affirmed predestination and freed man from his environment so that, instead of being a product of his environment, man became lord over it and a free man under God. Not even Sartre holds that man's existence is self-created. It is man's essence and nature which exists. It is man's essence and nature which exists. It is man's essence and nature which existential man. It is man's essence and nature which existential man seeks to create of his seeks to create out of his own being. It is man's essence and nature which existential man seeks to create out of his own being and quote the force of circumstances and quote. Man's existence is a product for Sartre of the absurd universe which again affects him by, quote, the force of circumstances, end quote, and the practical necessity for life and community. As a result, man's existence and his essence are products of the universe and of society, so that man is, despite his rebellion, essentially passive before them. He is reduced to a, quote, futile passion, end quote. For Orthodox Christianity... Man's existence and essence are the sovereign work of the triune God, not the nature or the universe, not of nature. Of the triune God, not of nature or the universe, so that, while man is passive in relationship to God, he is active in his relationship to the world around him and towards society. In that area, as a creature made in God's image, man exercises his freedom under God. In knowledge, righteousness and holiness, the redeemed man exercises dominion over all things, confident in the total meaning which undergirds all things and which assures him that his, quote, labour is not in vain in the Lord, end quote, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, because he works in a universe of total meaning, this totality of meaning comes from the triune God. It is personal. In the person of Christ, it perseveres him from falling and assures him of the unfailing government of, quote, the only wise God, our Saviour, end quote. In the joyful ascription of St. Jude, the believer has a certainty of total meaning, total salvation, and the fullness of victory and joy. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Saviour be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. 
Amen. Jude 24 and 25. A God who saves must be sovereign, personal, omniscient and omnipotent. He must be the self-existent one, he who is. Neither man nor society can legitimately make such a claim and neither can play the role of a saviour. And neither can play the role of saviour. When, however, existentialism leads men and societies to do precisely that, they will claim the powers of God over the world. They will insist on probing the mind of man totally and treating him as entirely subject to recreation. And they will insist on subjecting him totally to their determination. The God of Scripture is beyond man and this world, not on their level. The gods of existentialism are emerging out of the world and therefore in competition with the world. To make good their claims to be gods over men, they must obliterate other men, their rival claimants to godhood. Skinner thus will not allow man to be man. He declares that, quote, Careless references to purpose are still to be found in both physics and biology, but good practice has no place for them. Yet almost everyone attributes human behaviour to intentions, purposes, aims and goals. End quote. All men are for Skinner, simply products of their environments and are governed by a blind determinism. All men are held to be on a disaster course because of overpopulation, abuse of the environment and so on. How can Skinner extricate himself and his associates from this blind determinism and then determine that determining the world? As one reviewer noted, quote, It would take a deus ex machina to remove anyone from that apparatus, as Mr. Skinner has constructed it. His argument certainly doesn't. End quote. This is indeed the case. Skinner, after denying man everything which Christendom has seen as essential to his humanity, must suddenly transform himself, a denatured man, into a deus ex machina, a god who is able to save. The salvation he promises is, however, one of total slavery to the mind conditioners. It allows no secondary causality or freedom, but only a mindless, purposeless obedience to the will of his new gods. Salvation by anyone other than the sovereign, personal, omniscient and omnipotent God is not salvation, but rather total slavery and con- Salvation, but rather total slavery and control. It must be acknowledged, however, that men like Skinner, Marx, Stalin and others have been very much in the right in seeing the link between sovereignty and salvation. As a prelude to their plans of salvation, they insist on total sovereignty by an elite group whose plans constitute a new degree of predestination by the new gods. Sovereignty and salvation cannot be separated The pertinent question must therefore always be raised with respect to all would-be saviours. To whom does a... The pertinent question must therefore always be raised with respect to all would-be saviours. To whom does their plan of salvation give sovereignty and what is the nature of their plan or decree of pred... And what is the nature of their plan or decree of predestination? Give sovereignty. And what is the nature of their plan or decree of predestination? The sad fact is that not only is this question not asked, but the false ministers and priests of Christ are also busy denying God's sovereignty and his degree of predestination. and his decree of predestination. Practically, this means that they are denying salvation by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. But sovereignty denied does not disappear. 
it is simply transferred to another source. To deny the God of Scripture is implicitly to affirm other gods. And there we must end, folks. So thanks for tuning in. Hello to future me. Hello to my grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Well done for listening right to the end. If you would like to know more about this important Christian audiobook project, please go to nathanteacher.com. Thanks.